thank you for joining us for worship this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, today we're going to be taking a look at, in our message, the call of Abram, called from Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of the Canaanites, uh, and really what all was involved in that and the blessing that the Lord placed upon Abram. So thank you for joining us for worship. Please stand and we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai as his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they went and set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Nagab. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, starting in verse 6 through 21. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and everything, and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. We stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel, according to St. John, the sixth chapter, verses 51 through 69. John chapter six, verses 51 through 69. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? 
But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you, take, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the gospel of our Lord and praise to you, O Christ. In our prayers, I ask you to be in prayer for uh, things are going to be ramping up here, return of students. Also, Jules will be starting as our director of campus ministry and her and her husband are moving up here. So I, pr I ask you to keep all that in your prayer. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're so thankful that you have placed us here in, such, in a community in which the nations of the world, people from all over the country come, people from all over the world come here to attend Penn State University. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit is at work in hearts and minds of people right now, preparing them to receive the good news that is found in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would work through the student leaders. I want to name them uh, through Emily and Luke and Eli and Chase and I pray that it would work powerfully, powerfully through them as student leaders, Lord God. You, you would um, do a great and mighty work that more and more students be drawn unto you, that there be people that are coming to faith, Lord God. And I ask, Lord, that you would be with Jules as she relocates up here to be our director of campus ministry. Pray that your spirit would rest upon her, that you would bless her and her husband, Ethan, in the transition to uh, living up here in this area and that your, your hand of blessing would be upon them. You would work powerfully and mightily through them. So Lord God, we come before you, lifting these things before you and trusting everything to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, our Savior, who's taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
We're continuing on with our series through the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, the call of Abram. The title of the message is Called to a Far Country. Let's pray. Gracious Father, in the twists and turns of life, um, may we trust in you and your calling for our life, that uh, you will lead us and guide us in the path that we should go. May we listen to your voice, listen to your word that you have revealed to us and have been passed down through the generations for such a time as this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so there have been times in history where it seems like the gates of hell will prevail against the church and his people. There had been much evil in the world that, that God, you know, it had increased to such a point, the evil in the world, that God sent a great flood to wipe out all of humanity, except for Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Several generations after Noah and his family had left the ark, evil was already growing again in the form of a united front against God in building a tower, people constructing this tower, the Tower of Babel, and seeking to make a name for themselves in rebellion against God. God again stepped in and confused their languages and dispersed the people over the face of the earth in order to mitigate the effects of evil so it would be more isolated in sense. Now the portion of the people though remained in the Mesopotamian region. Most importantly the descendants of Shem. At least nine generations have uh, transpired between the time of Shem to the time of Abram. And so one notable thing in that list of generations at the end of chapter 11 uh, of Genesis uh, from Shem to Abram is that you see the life expectancy uh, of people steadily decreasing. So pre-flood, the life expectancy was hundreds and hundreds of years. And as long as 900, Methuselah, the ninth, oldest living person, 900 and some years. After the flood, the life expectancy decreases rather rapidly, coming down, 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 down after the flood. Uh, so the conditions, the environment has changed. Uh, people are not living as long as they used to. The other thing to note at the end of chapter 11 of Genesis is that the father of Abram was Terah, and he had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran, we, we note in the end of chapter 11, is the father of Lot, who is going to factor in to the interaction, to interaction with Abram. So Lot is Abram's nephew. There is additional piece of relevant information that comes at the end of chapter 11, and that is that Sarai, Abram's wife is not able to have children, has not had any child to this point. So again, uh, this back drop of the true worship of God uh, being erased, in other words, things are happening that are causing people to fall away from God and from the true worship of God. And again, God intervenes to preserve his church and his people. That's where we pick up in chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Between the years 1880 and 1921, approximately 4.2 million Italians immigrated mostly from southern Italy to the United States. They came from extremely impoverished and destitute conditions. Their vision of the United States in their mind was a place where the streets were paved with gold. The reality when they arrived was much different, of course. What awaited them for many of them was hardship, slums, disease, death, 
and abuse awaited many of them. Into that cesspool of where most of the immigrants, many of the immigrants went to New York City, into that cesspool, a nun from Italy by the name of Cabrini was sent to New York and founded a much needed orphanage along with eventually with hospitals and education for the immigrants. Leaving your country, your homeland, is not easy under the best of conditions. Abram, Abram is called by God to leave his homeland, to leave his country, his extended family, not to go to the United States at we, at, of which at least something was known for those immigrants that were going to the United States, even if they had a misperception uh, in regards to how great it was. But Abram was being to a, led to a land that God said, I will show you where to go. God's going to show him. Imagine with me the type of faith that it would take if God came to you tomorrow and said, I want you to leave everything, your house, your neighborhood, your home, and, I, and your relatives that might be nearby, friends, family, and I will show you where I want you to live. Would you have enough faith to do that? Sad to say, for many of us, our faith is only as strong as our perceived ability to do something with the resources that we have at hand. When we have so much, it's far too easy and comfortable to live within the boundaries of the resources that we have and call it faith. God calls Abram out of where he, had, he was to preserve God's people, to preserve the church. God is always the builder of the church, not us. If we aren't faithful, he will raise up someone else to continue the witness of the church. So he says to Abram, verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There are seven blessings that God bestows upon Abraham, Abram. First is, he says, I will make you into a great nation. So here's a person who's homeless, going to a place where, you know, he doesn't know anybody, he doesn't know anything, he owns nothing, and God says, I'm going to make out of you a great nation. And that's in earthly terms he's talking about here at this point. And then he says, in general, I will bless you. He just says, your life in general will be blessed. You will have this prosperity. You will have success in what you do. Your life in general will be blessed. And he says to him also, I will make your name great. That's a title only attributed to Abram, to David, and of course to Jesus, right? Make your name great. So that you may be a blessing. This is the fourth thing that you will be a blessing. So God isn't interested in just throwing out blessings for the sake of you, <coughs> uh, uh, any of us selfishly holding on to them. We're a blessed, <coughs> we're blessed to be a blessing to others. And then he says to him, the, the fifth thing is, I will bless, bless those who bless you. So those who choose to uh, care about Abram, to help him, to uh, seek the same God that Abram, Abram is worshiping, I'm going to bless them as well. Bless those who bless you. And 
He also says, I will curse those who curse you. Now, it is God that is going to do that. That's not our prerogative. That's not up to us to curse our enemies. God is the one. That's his prerogative. He is the one that will do that. He is the one that watches over us. It's in his timing. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Don't take vengeance into your own hands. Vengeance is mine. And then also he says, the seventh thing, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the, shall be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So they will consider themselves blessed through you. In the New Testament, in Galatians 3, verses 7, starting in verse 7, know then that this, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, Abram's name, later on renamed Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So then through him, you will be blessed. So it's interesting, and it's no mistake whatsoever, uh, that Abram receives a sevenfold blessing. Because seven is the most important number in the first five books of the Bible, what is known as the Pentateuch. And seven is the number of completeness. Six days, God created the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day, he rested. So this, this, this concept of seven being this number of completeness. So he said, what he's saying is to Abram is so complete will my blessing be to upon you, Abram, that it cannot fail. It will be carried out. Now, if you were Abram listen to, listening to all of this, what would be your reaction? Here you are a person told to leave your homeland to go who knows where, a homeless man. And when he died, how much land did Abram own in Canaan where God led him? You know what he owned at the time of his death in the land of Canaan where God led him? His tomb, a cave where he was buried. That's it. If we want a safe life where everything is figured out beforehand, we will likely be missing out on the great things that God desires to do and to accomplish through his church and his people called by faith. Our call is not, not to have every step of our life figured out with the resources that we have on hand, but to live a life of faith in and through Jesus Christ allowing him to lead us. So he continues on. So Abram went, verse 4, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. So he steps forward in faith. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and I, Ai on the east, I on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called the name, um, called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. And so he journeyed, a homeless man on a mission from God. When that nun I spoke about from Italy, Cabrini, came to New York City, 
She had had some afflictions in her life. She was very sickly, very weak. And she arrived in New York City as a weak, sickly woman with no resources. So one of the best quotes from this movie about her life was this. We can serve our weakness or we can serve our purpose. Begin the mission, the means will come. Abram had nothing. No power to displace the Canaanites that were there. No ownership of the land. But it, what he did have was a mission. And so wherever he went, in the land that God was eventually going to give, he worshipped God. He built an altar and he moved on, trusting that God would provide. The earth is the Lord and the fullness therein, cries the psalmist. Your neighborhood, that's the Lord's. You, the halls of your school, that's the Lord's. Where you work, that's the Lord's. Go through life in worship and in trust in the Lord and the mission that he has given to his, his church, his people, to advance the kingdom. Begin the mission, and he provides the means. Let's pray. Gracious Father, help us to trust that you will provide the means. We, we have operated so long on just limiting ourselves by the resources we can count in our hands, what we think we have to move forward with. And we forget that you, the God of the universe, have given a great mission to your church. If we were to step forward in faith, trusting that you will provide as we faithfully walk forward with the mission you have given to your church. You will provide. May we trust in you always. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let us confess together our faith in the triune God and all he has done for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and, and the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. We're having a, a time of confession before the Lord, and the Lord knows what's really on our heart, but what he's inviting us to do is come before him, be honest before him, come into his presence. Uh, don't hide anything from him, run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God. We should run towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from the words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So, Lord, let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserved your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall we fear? God perfectly loves you, perfectly watches over you. There is no fear in love, for perfect love drives out all fear. So we go forth with confidence, knowing that God loves us with an everlasting love, to proclaim the good news in the world in which we live. And the world desperately needs to hear this good news. So go forth, not in your own strength, but in the strength and the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.